Hello, I'm Nicole Wooten uh, with the Hudson Highlands Land Trust. Thank you so much for joining us for this segment of Relearning Highlands History. Mm -hmm. I'm here today with Peter Bunton, who's the previous Education Director at Historic Hudson Valley and now Chairperson of the Mid-Hudson Anti-Slavery Project. We're going to be talking about slavery as part of the history of this region. So Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm glad to be here. Great. All right, so to kick it off, uh, Peter, what is the Mid-Hudson Anti-Slavery History Project? Well, uh, the, uh, our organization began in 2006. And in that year, there was a replica of the Amistad ship. And the Amistad uh, event, as you may remember, uh, had to do with uh, enslaved people coming across the ocean and they mutinied and they took control of the ship before it landed. Uh, so there was a, a replica of that ship sailing up and down the Hudson River. And in Dutchess County, there were several people who were interested uh, generally in the history of slavery and, and whatever in this region. And they decided to see if they could uh, get a little bit of money together and have the ship dock at Poughkeepsie. So it was out of that specific development that uh, a broader interest in exploring the slavery and anti-slavery history of the Mid-Hudson uh, region began. The organization uh, was composed of local historians, uh, town historians, et cetera, uh, uh, academics such as uh, uh, Vassar College folks, both professors and students who did some research, uh, church people, uh, and, and uh, a mixture of African American and whites who had interest in this overall subject. So out of this, they began to uh, explore more deeply the history of slavery and anti-slavery in the region. Now they drew on a number of uh, resources that had already been published, most specifically in places like the uh, the Dutchess County Historical Society had a lot of records and research reports on the history of the county and slavery. Also Quakerism, which is a big factor, especially in the anti-slavery movement. Uh, and by 2010, they published a book, or we published a book, uh, called Slavery, Anti-Slavery, and the Underground Railroad, a Dutchess County Guide. And that book, which is about 40 pages long or so, identifies people, places, movement, uh, tie-ins to national history, et cetera, around those three uh, topics. Uh, now, what we have been doing since then is, uh, well, our primary goals are research, uh, interpretation of those events, and then also education. So we've given a lot of lectures, we have some school curricula, we sponsored a, a singing group uh, which focuses on abolitionist songs. They're called the Duchess Anti-Slavery Singers. Uh, and we've uh, published a number of other smaller works. Uh, in addition to which, we have a larger publication uh, which kind of complements the Duchess County Guide. That's called 36 Anti-Slavery Songs. And these are original abolitionist songs uh, from the 30 year period, 1830 to 1860, roughly. Uh, we're concentrating more today on uh, continuing the interpretation of this original research and also uh, broadening our educational efforts. And I'll stop there in case you wanna ask anything about those particular items. Well, I think that was a fantastic overview. It sounds like you all start from the very beginning of slavery and anti-slavery here in the Hudson Valley and uh, move through research and education and uh, getting the word out in a lot of great resources, which I will recap again at the end. Sure. Uh, so you've already touched on this, uh, but how is slavery a part of the history of the Hudson Valley and the greater Highlands region? We hear a lot about um, history of uh, colonialism and mm -hmm. wars that have been fought um, in this area, but uh, there seems to be less of an emphasis sometimes uh, in the telling of the history of slavery in this region. So what are, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, that, 
a great question because it has to do with not only the facts of this area, but also how our emphasis and our interpretation on the history of New York has changed over time. And you are right to point out that originally there was most of our emphasis in the historical community on the development of New York as a colony and the state, the economics, generally the expansion of people, the expansion of different types of jobs and industries, et cetera. And slavery was not given very much notice. In fact, there was such a de-emphasization of slavery that still today, I would guess that the vast majority of people don't realize that slavery existed in New York State. School programs, when we give talks, et cetera, a lot of people, I didn't know there were slaves here. Well, there were more slaves in New York and specifically in the Hudson Valley, stretching from Albany down to Westchester, uh, than any place north of Maryland. So at its peak, there were uh, several uh, uh, 30 to 40,000 enslaved people across the colony and, and the state uh, with a, a major concentration here in the Hudson Valley. Now, how does this fit in? Well, slavery was integral to the development of the colony. Early on, there were very, very few people who wanted to move here to New York. And the primary reason for that was the vast majority of the land along the Hudson Valley and in other places were given over to maybe a dozen or so giant land barons, like the Phillipses, the Van Cortlands, the Livingstons, the Van Rensselaers. And they were more interested in holding these estates and perhaps dabbling in easily uh, easy gains like working with the fur trade or maybe tying their connections more to the mercantile interests involved in New Amsterdam and then New York City. And it wasn't until the early decades of the 1700s when we began to see a noticeable population growth of both white Europeans who were coming over from England and Holland and France and other places to now begin to ply their trade as primarily farmers, but also other tradespeople. Now, there weren't very many coming over. So in these early decades of the 1700s, the labor came mostly from the enslaved population. So we see a big growth in the number of slaves from the by 1725 up through roughly 1790 when the first census of African Americans in the United States was taken. It then begins to fall off rapidly in New York. But for that six or seven decades in the middle of the 1800s, uh, slaves pay, played a huge part and a very huge part in the, the Hudson Valley region primarily agriculture as farmers, etc., but also they worked as boat pilots, uh, stonemasons, uh, carpenters, uh, etc. The women, there were much fewer women than there were men, women would primarily be working in uh, so-called domestic sphere. So it was a very integral part of the early history of New York. Thank you for that overview. Um, and as a land conservation organization, Hudson House mm -hmm. Land Trust is very interested in how slavery and anti-slavery relate to the people and the history of this specific land. So as you pointed out, uh, even the topography uh, made a difference in probably when slavery came yes. to the area mm -hmm. um, and made a difference for uh, what roles people who were enslaved uh, were forced to take on. Um, right. right. Yeah, we have to distinguish when we talk, well, uh, I, I think there's probably still a pretty strong uh, belief or understanding when people hear the word slavery, they would think about southern states in the 1800s working on cotton plantations. Uh, but that's generally not the case when you talk about 
in the North. And it affected every colony in the North, not just New York. However, New York was the second to the last state to uh, abolish slavery. New Jersey had some lingering effects that carried on uh, and, and slavery there wasn't officially ended until the 13th Amendment in 1865. But there was a whole variety of different jobs that enslaved people uh, uh, took on. A lot of it was agricultural in Dutchess County and part of the land trust area, you've got Fishkill and East Fishkill. And there was a uh, big agricultural development in Fishkill and some of the larger populations of enslaved people would have been there. Not so much in Putnam, uh, you've got more hills there, et cetera. Although probably on the very Eastern side of Putnam in what is today Route 22, that probably served as a route from Westchester County up to Dutchess for uh, the Underground Railroad. Now on the west side of the river, uh, Orange County uh, was had a pretty substantial enslaved population. Here again, probably further back in places near Montgomery and whatever, not so much close to the river where you've got all of your big mountains and everything like that. However, there is something to keep in mind as well. When we talk about enslavement here, most people owned one or two maybe three slaves. Here again, it wasn't like the southern plantations where they had thousands and thousands of acres and they might have had 50, 100, 300, 400 slaves working on these huge agricultural plantations. Farmers here would have, as I say, one or two, uh, you know, maybe three in some cases, it might be a couple more. So we're talking about a smaller number per household, per owner. And as you pointed out, um, New York had more slaves than any other area to the north and was also one of the last uh, colonies mm -hmm. state to yep. um, end abolish slavery. Right. So right. that the low number of enslavement of people uh, may have been less, uh, less of a cultural issue and more of a, again, uh, topographical, so less ability to have large plantations up in this region due to the topography. Would you say that's that that certainly that certainly was part of it, and uh, there was less wealth per person. So uh, you might, if you were in Virginia or if you were in Georgia or South Carolina or Alabama, uh, the large slaveholders there would have hundreds sometimes. There were also small farmers in those southern states, some of whom did not own slaves, again some of whom might have owned one or two or a couple. And that was more the case here in the north uh, and New York being the best example. So uh, you've touched on a, a few different topics throughout this. I'm wondering uh, if you can dive in a little bit more about what are the topics that the Knit Hudson Anti-Slavery History Project has researched? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, well, uh, what we, we have concentrated on Dutchess County and somewhat on Ulster County. We haven't really gone beyond that, and there was enough there for us to chew on in the very beginning. Uh, that it took a few years to complete that research and to put together our findings. Uh, there, are, there has been some other research in some of the other areas, and I think we're going to touch on that a little bit in, in, the fourth, uh, in the fourth thing. So I would break our research down into a couple of different uh, things that we actually project in the book. One is people. So who were the people? Who were the enslaved people? We know some of their names. We know some of them who lived in the Dutchess County, Mid-Hudson region were runaways. They escaped slavery in the South. So for instance, a big name, uh, both locally and nationally, is someone by the name of John Bolding, B-O-L-D-I-N-G. John Bolding uh, worked as a slave in South Carolina. And he escaped and came up north and settled in Poughkeepsie uh, in, well, I guess it's around the 1830s or so. I can't recall the exact date. Uh, 
uh, and he worked as a tailor and lived and had his business there for many years. And then in 1851, on the heels of the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, which was part of the Great Compromise of 1850, uh, a slave catcher, as they might have been called back then, found him, had him arrested, and he was brought back to his owner in South Carolina. Now, that case made national attention. Uh, there were several of these fugitive slave cases that uh, were written about extensively at the time, and John Boldings was one of them. Now, it so happens that he was well-liked, and uh, there was also at this time a quite strong anti-slavery presence in the valley. And several dozen people in Poughkeepsie and the surrounding area contributed money about $2,000 to buy his release. And they did. And John Bolding came back to Poughkeepsie, went back to his trade uh, as a tailor, uh, and lived the rest of his life there. And there are other people, um, such as Samuel Ringgold Ward. Samuel Ringgold Ward, another African American, had very strong connections to New York City and the uh, New York City Vigilance Society, which was attempting to protect both runaways as well as free blacks, and would funnel people for the Underground Railroad up to John Ringgold Ward. He also became a very uh, strong and popular anti-slavery speaker. And after he left Poughkeepsie, he traveled around the state and, and gave a number of speeches. And then you have somebody like Lucretia Mott, who was a, uh, a Quaker and uh, lived and worked for a time in the Millbrook area and taught at the, uh, the Millbrook Friends School, Nine Partners School. And uh, she went on to uh, maintain her anti-slavery advocacy and also play a role in the fight for women's voting. So we look at, and there's a dozen or two more. So we look at the lives of specific people and what, they specific, what their role was. We also take a look at uh, places and buildings such as we mentioned the Nine Partner School, which, which was a big uh, place, the Oblong Meeting House out at Pauling in the eastern corner of the state, which was a stop on the Underground Railroad, uh, the African American AMZ Zion Church, the Smith Street Church, was what black churches had a major role. Uh, and then we take a look at uh, events. So, uh, and how these events tie in. So for instance, the Missouri Compromise fight that began in 1819 was introduced by James Talmadge and he lived in Eastern Dutchess County in the Millbrook area. And it was his amendment that was introduced which would have uh, prohibited slavery over a period of time in the new territory of Missouri. Also in the 1830s and early 40s, there was an enormous uh, eruption of anti-slavery societies in Dutchess County. The Countywide Historical Society, whose records are in the New York City Public Library, and also almost all the towns locally, Poughkeepsie and Dover and all these little cities and towns in the county, they all developed their own anti-slavery societies. So I would look at, at trying to understand this in terms of the people, uh, in terms of specific places that were important in this history, and then also the events. And we try to look at those and relate them to national trends. That's generally the way we have approached this. That is fascinating. Thank you for sharing not only those concepts, but also the specific stories of um, folks who had escaped slavery or were part of vigilant societies. Um, or movements. It sounds like there was a big mix of slavery and anti-slavery influences throughout the New York There's, history that it also yeah. influenced how land ownership and land use occurred um, and the remnants of that we can certainly still. Yeah, yeah. And, and there was there was also a lot of opposition to the anti-slavery movement. Mm. Uh, there, uh, One of the um, American Anti-Slavery Anti Society orators, uh, 
was scheduled to speak at one of the local churches in Poughkeepsie, and uh, a group of people who were opposed to that came and started throwing rocks and stones and breaking windows, prevented the talk from ever happening, and chased the orator home to one of his friend's houses. Uh, and also across the river in Ulster County, there was something called Society for the Apprehension of Slaves, kind of an early police force, if you think of it. Uh, and they grouped together, uh, they were paid and sponsored by local slave owners, and the local slave owners would alert this society saying, hey, I think one of my slaves or somebody's neighbor's slave is getting ready to run away or has been acting up, etc. And this uh, society, and they had riders, as they called them, to go out and basically intimidate the enslaved people or catch them and bring them back. So it wasn't just anti-slavery sentiment. There was a lot of anti-anti-slavery uh, sentiment. Uh, who, people who were opposed to disrupting the status quo, uh, people who wanted to maintain slavery. Certainly, it was already abolished in in, in New York by that time. Uh, but there was a lot of mixed sentiment uh, among the white uh, population in this area. Very important to know. Thank you for bringing that forward. Um, I am interested. You mentioned Poughkeepsie with a couple of times now, and I'm curious if you know of any stories um, kind of in the heart of the Highlands region or spreading out. Uh, so in areas like Cold Spring, Phillipstown, you'd mentioned Putnam County a little mm -hmm. earlier before on uh, the other side of the river in Cornwall, um, or if you could speak to any stories around those areas. Well, I don't have much, and, and, and I did some more looking. Uh, one of the things that we don't have, and it would be great if the county historians or the local historical society were able to uh, spend some time researching this, we don't have good county slavery histories for a lot of the counties in New York State, and it's not just the Highlands region. Uh, the Dutchess County Guide that we did, uh, there's a fair amount of information for Ulster County, but no overall look. I haven't been able to find anything for Putnam County. There's some genealogical stuff, which we can talk about later in terms of sources and references. Now, Orange County, interestingly, has a number of uh, both genealogical records and they also, there's also a compilation by Roger King of uh, sites in Orange County, both along the river and further inland, uh, that pertain to uh, possible routes and safe houses, et cetera, regarding the Underground Railroad. Because we know there was a route coming out of Pennsylvania up through New Jersey and up along the western side of the river. Uh, so some of the runaways would come up uh, through New Jersey and then head out lower western New York State, reaching eventually Buffalo or Erie, uh, and then cross into Canada primarily. Some came up the eastern side, both along the river, some others through the highlands. As I said, probably some following what we would call the Quaker necklace that extended from Brooklyn all the way up to the Ropeby Farm in Vermont, along that hard eastern edge separating New York from Connecticut, then Massachusetts, then Vermont at, at, at Lake Champlain, uh, and then some up on the western border of the Hudson River. So Roger King has, and what he, what he did was, is great, he collected, uh, how many, a couple of dozen newspaper stories about supposed stops or safe houses for Underground Railroad activity. So there is some there that would pertain to the, the uh, Hudson Highlands area. I don't, or I haven't found much for Putnam County. Uh, and then, now, you, 
the Highlands kind of ends right at the top of Rockland County, right? You don't go into Rockland at all, or? Yeah, the Highlands region does go into Rockland. It or... does go into Rockland. Yeah, yeah so, yeah, that would be another area that could use some good, uh, some more exploration. You know, this relates to another thing that I, I think we said at the beginning, which is change over time. Uh, and, I, and I mentioned the, uh, or if I haven't, I'll mention uh, the, uh, the meetings that were sponsored by Historic Hudson Valley. And uh, there were two, one in February and one about two weeks ago. And the theme of those meetings uh, was having to, uh, has to do with sites and historic organizations taking a new look at the history of slavery in New York. Slavery in the North was kind of the umbrella theme. Uh, and there are a number of organizations and you should think about including yourselves in this same, underneath this same umbrella. They are re-looking at their site's history. So some of these mansions or plantations uh, and Boscobel has been included. Now Boscobel did not have a large, uh, uh, population of blacks. There were some servants, etc. But they're also looking at, hey, we never look at the people who lived here all the time. And I will tell you that Phillipsburg Manor in Tarrytown, the same situation. The very earliest interpretation focused on Frederick Phillips and his family. But essentially, Frederick Phillips never lived at Phillipsburg Manor. He lived in Lower Manhattan. So uh, interpretations now are beginning to change and we're beginning to look at them. And I think the period we're living in now is so exciting because people who are running these history organizations and other related sites and, uh, and groups such as yourselves, you are in the beginning or the middle of a period of restudy and reinterpretation of our state's history. And that is so important. And for me as an historian, so very exciting. So uh, I, would, I would urge you to contact a Historic Hudson Valley to find out about these sessions that they've had. Uh, and then uh, more work is being done as we speak. But I would say that right now, comprehensive looks at the county histories, et cetera, uh, leaves something to be desired. But there are, in, and, and also genealogical stuff has really taken off in the past couple of decades as well. Right. Um, There's so many sources to turn to. Yes. Um, yep. And I, I appreciate you mentioning that a lot of organizations in this area are really taking a, a relook or relearning mm -hmm. their history not only uh, historic sites, but also land conservation organizations, since we work you know, every day in the management, interpretation, and full understanding of the land. Um, so I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, this is part of Hudson Highlands Land Trust effort to fully engage uh, in diversity, equity, inclusion, justice. Um, and, and, slavery, so. I, and I, I, re I read that notice about your diversity, and, and, and it's fabulous. It's fabulous, and congratulations for, for putting that front and center. And there's no, there are so many pieces to this pie and this puzzle that whatever anybody can do to contribute is going to be valuable. Uh, so I, just words of encouragement to keep that going. <laughs> Absolutely, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, sure. and you, already covered this pretty well, but I just want to list uh, out that if folks want to learn more about anti-slavery yeah. yeah. um, and history of this land, sure. uh, check yeah. your county historians, your local historical societies. Um, they may be the experts in these areas, and you can help them bring the pertinent information about slavery and anti-slavery. Sure. To the top. Uh, you also mentioned the um, slavery, anti-slavery, and the Underground Railroad, a Dutchess County Guide. Um, right. right. Anti-slavery songs. Uh, Peter, are there any other resources that you would recommend? Yeah, for for New for New York and especially the lower the lower area of New York, the best place to start is uh, go online at Historic Hudson Valley to the site uh, People Not Property, 
and look at their bibliography. That is by far the largest and best source, especially for lower New York. Uh, and because they have a lot of material obviously related to the local history of the Phillipses and the Van Cortlands and slavery studies, et cetera. But what HHV has done is they have brought in, uh, including uh, long hammering by uh, Williams Myers, uh, and they've brought in things like uh, Hodges's book on runaway slave ads, uh, which I would supplement uh, with Susan Stesson Cohn's book called In Defiance. But that's, that's a great place to start is the uh, bibliography on the Historic Hudson Valley site. Uh, and we have a few things related further up in, uh, in New York in our Dutchess County Guide. There's a bibliography there. Genealogical societies, I think, as either you or I mentioned, uh, if you want to know what's really happening locally, contact your local genealogical society. A lot of these have done explorations of black families and they have traced histories back. So that's, that's a place to start. And also your local and your county uh, historical societies. So Putnam and then Westchester uh, and uh, Rockland and Orange County. Orange County has just begun, well, I should say the town of Montgomery. I'm not sure you cover Montgomery. I, it's hard to tell how far in the, the Highland Park goes, but the uh, Montgomery has just begun a new project to uh, protect and revitalize the colored cemetery in the town of Montgomery, which may contain the graves of as many as 200 African Americans. So uh, that's, uh, that's something to look at as well. Thank you for all of those resources. And Peter, thank you again sure. so much for uh, joining us for today and sharing your knowledge on slavery and anti-slavery in the Hudson Valley. Well, thanks so much for having me. I greatly appreciate it. And let's stay in touch. For sure, absolutely.